Hi, everyone. Welcome to the All Things Amyloid podcast, where we feature patients, caregivers, and clinicians who discuss amyloidosis, a rare and incurable disease. Amyloidosis occurs when the body builds up abnormal amounts of misfolded amyloid protein, which can lead to serious and life-threatening outcomes. I'm your host, Mackenzie, an amyloidosis patient and founder of Mackenzie's Mission. Our goal for this podcast is to raise awareness and share firsthand what it's like to live with this disease, to care for those affected by it, and to treat it. We hope this leads to earlier diagnosis and start of treatment, which will improve patient lives. The treatments for patients with ATTR, transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis, has advanced significantly since 2018, when there were no FDA-approved therapies. In this episode, we hear from Dr. Matt Maurer at Columbia University. Adapted from his video, he shares how the diagnostic imaging techniques have significantly improved, thereby reducing the need for an invasive heart biopsy. In addition, he shares fascinating statistics on how the age and stage of diagnosis has been evolving. Based on today's clinical trials, providers are optimistic that the expansion of options for patients will continue. The future is indeed looking brighter. Hi, my name is Matt Moore. I'm a professor of medicine at Columbia University and the director of the Cardiac Amyloidosis Program. And I'm thrilled to be with you today to give a brief overview on the future for patients with transthyroid and cardiac amyloidosis. It's looking much brighter than before. Um, these are my disclosures. And um, I'm very, very excited about the progress in this arena in caring for patients with transthyroid and amyloidosis. But I think we all as healthcare providers um, should be a little concerned about the high cost of therapy, which I fear in the future may be unsustainable. But let's get into the story. So um, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this condition, amyloidosis is a protein disease caused by uh, misfolded proteins that deposit in various organs in the body. Um, patients have a variety of um, nonspecific symptoms making the diagnosis uh, difficult. And these are data from a while ago uh, highlighting the previous experience of patients, uh, predominantly who had um, AL amyloid, um, but it's synonymous or analogous to patients with TTR and that many patients had to see uh, more than three providers before a formal diagnosis was made. It often took uh, a majority of patients more than six months to make a diagnosis, and many of them received an incorrect diagnosis at first. Several of them required air travel to establish a diagnosis in order to get to a center of excellence. And um, only 18% of those with so-called AL amyloid due to a plasma cell dyscrasia had a correct diagnosis made by a cardiologist, which is uh, disconcerting to me as a cardiologist. And cardiologists, are unfortunately, are the subgroup in medicine or subspecialist to most commonly misdiagnose uh, patients with uh, cardiac amyloidosis as having hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, the good news is this was the past experience. And um, most providers, um, uh, physicians, nurses, um, allied health professionals, impressions of the prevalence of cardiac amyloid is shown here, where someone's looking for, quote unquote, a needle in a haystack. But these are the emerging data that have accrued over the last few years, um, demonstrating that 16% of patients undergoing transcatheter aortic valve replacement for significant aortic stenosis have concomitant TTR amyloid. Among patients who are hospitalized for heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction who have an increased wall thickness, 13% have transthyroid and cardiac amyloidosis. And in the community dwelling setting, while less frequent than in the hospital, it's still quite prevalent in that 6% of all HFPEF patients had amyloidosis. Amongst patients who have presumed hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, about 5% have uh, amyloid. And in those with presumed HCM who are over 60, one in four because transthyroid and amyloidosis is a disorder that disproportionately afflicts older adults, particularly uh, older adult males. And it turns out that um, in just older adults, about 1% or 2% over the age of 75 will have demonstrable uptake of uh, a substance called PYP or pyrophosphate. It's a bone imaging isotope used to make a non-invasive diagnosis of transthyroid and amyloidosis. And so I think the reality is here is this condition is much more common than we once thought. Still a, quote-unquote, rare disease, but not the rarest of rare diseases. 
One of the seminal changes in the field has been that we used to require an endomyocardial heart biopsy to make a diagnosis of amyloid, and that's no longer required in a vast majority of patients who have transthyroid in amyloidosis, the most common form. We utilize a scanning technique that leverages isotopes that were originally developed to image the bones. These are called um, technetium isotopes. There are various ones. The most common one in the United States is uh, called the PYP or pyrophosphate. And sample scans are shown here in which we show a patient who has um, grade zero scan, grade one, two, and three. And the differences are pretty self-evident, but I'll just point them out. So this is what's called planar imaging. It's like a chest x-ray. You can see the sternum here and each of the ribs. And you don't see any uptake in the area where the myocardium is. Um, uh, additionally, um, you can uh, see that um, here's a patient with a grade one scan in which there's uptake, slight uptake in the heart but not much. Here's a patient with a grade two scan where the uptake in the area of the myocardium is equal to that of the bones. And here's a patient with a grade three scan where the uptake is greater than the bones. Patients with grade two and three scans are considered to have TTR amyloid, assuming they have no substrate for AL amyloid, that is they don't have any monoclonal proteins. This scan has revolutionized their ability to diagnose people and diagnose them earlier. And shown at the bottom here are SPECT imaging, which are using CAT scans to further localize. Here is the sternum you can see seen in these scans. And these are each little ribs that you can see. And here is uptake in the myocardium, clearly in the wall of the heart, shown in a grade two and a grade three scan. So a revolutionary test that has led to the higher diagnostic yield and the increased awareness of this particular condition. Uh, these are data that are recently published um, from the National Amyloid Center um, in London, one of the most preeminent centers to study amyloid in the world. This paper was published in circulation just uh, last year. And you can see that over time, there's been a marked increase in the number of cases that they're seeing. And that occurs in all forms of amyloid, but particularly the age-related wild-type form of amyloid that's literally exploded in which over a several year period, five years, they're seeing more than 600 cases um, at this center. Uh, we had had similar um, uh, changes at Columbia. We've demonstrated them slightly differently, where you can see a marked increase in the number of subjects that we're seeing. And orange is those who have so-called wild-type disease. Um, that is the group that's grown the most. So a lot more cases that are being diagnosed. And notably, the National Amyloid Center uh, has shown um, uh, that um, with the increase in number of cases, the stage of the disease has changed as well. So stage one is early disease, stage two is intermediate, and stage three is late phase disease. And you can see kind of here that we had only about 42% who had early disease, 39% intermediate, and more who had late phase disease. And more recently, the overall numbers have grown in predominant those with early phase disease. This, therefore, has led to um, patients living longer because they're diagnosed in an earlier time period in the course of their illness. And there's been dramatic improvements in survival. And this is not in the context of disease-modifying therapy. This is not with a specific treatment. This is just because we're able to identify people at an earlier stage and, in fact, at a time period where emerging therapies are likely to be most beneficial before significant cardiac dysfunction has occurred. Similar data at our center using PYP uh, is shown here. So here's our patients diagnosed between 2001 and 13. Everyone was diagnosed with a heart biopsy. Now, more recently, only 18% of the patients need a heart biopsy, and a vast majority can be diagnosed by the scintigraphy that I mentioned. And with the change in the mode of diagnosis, there's a change in the uh, spectrum of disease, even more dramatic. We use a Columbia staging system. Again, uh, blue is early disease, orange is intermediate, and gray is late phase disease. And you can see, thankfully, there are very few patients now diagnosed with advanced cardiac amyloidosis. Concordant, uh, as was seen in the National Amyloid Center in uh, London, oh, these are data from Columbia, and you can see over time periods here, uh, early phase of study, middle phase, and late, there's been dramatic improvements in the survival over five years. Um, uh, in our patients, which is really um, fantastic.
Slightly different, though, uh, the Columbia experience is a little more complicated in that we've had access over the last few years to not only um, non-invasive techniques to diagnose early, but we've had access to disease-modifying therapy. So let me show you um, these particular data so that you can um, begin to understand. This is what we call um, a Cox regression analysis. Um, each one of these is a hazard ratio. So this is, uh, the, indicates whether the risk is above one, higher or lower, an increased risk of God forbid mortality. So for every year that someone gets older, there's a 1% increased risk of the chance of dying because the hazard ratio is 1.01, .01, and this is a 1% increased risk. This was not significant. There was no significant difference between men and women. It turns out that those patients who have variant hereditary disease, a genetic variation, have a 75% greater risk of passing away than those who have wild type. That was significant. Our staging system that we use that involves uh, biomarkers, New York heart class, and the daily dose of diuretics, and it's a nine-point staging system, was associated with a 52% increased risk, God forbid, of passing away, statistically significant. And you can see, though, over time, compared to the early era when we were diagnosing patients, that those diagnosed between 2014 and 2016 compared to the earlier had a lower risk of passing away, a reduced risk by almost half. And those in the more recent area, they also had a reduced risk, a reduced risk by about 68%. So we're getting better and better at diagnosing people earlier, and the risk of, God forbid, passing away is going down. And this is what we call stabilizer therapy. This includes both a drug called tefaminus and diflunosil. And the patients who took stabilizer therapy in our database had a 75% risk reduction in the chance of dying uh, compared to patients who didn't. We subsequently did a multivariate analysis looking at the variables that were significant up here. And the main message you can see is that stabilizer therapy, irrespective of the era or the stage of the patient, is associated with a significant reduction in mortality, uh, indicating that not only are we identifying people earlier, but we have new uh, therapies that are significantly impacting on the quality and quantity of life for patients. More recently, we've also developed some newer therapies. So the only FDA currently approved therapy for transthyroid and cardiac amyloidosis is tefamidus, which I mentioned in the previous slide. These are data evaluating a therapy called patisseran. This was approved to treating variant disease, people who have a genetic variation and neuropathy, but has not been approved yet by the FDA for treatment of patients with uh, predominant cardiomyopathy, um, including the wild type or age-related. So we studied 360 patients. We randomly assigned them to patisseran or placebo. And after only 12 months of treatment with patisseran, there were significant benefits in the patients who got the drug in their ability to walk down a hallway and their quality of life. And those data are shown here. In red, so-called, are the patients on placebo. And you can see that over time, they had a decline in their six-minute hall walk. Whereas the patients who received the drug, Patisseran had a stable uh, uh, six-minute hall walk, and these were statistically a different differences with a difference of about 15 meters after only 12 months. Similarly, this is the uh, quality of life questionnaire where you can see patients on drug shown in uh, the blue or magenta were stable. Their quality of life was stable, whereas those who didn't receive the novel drug and were on placebo, they had a decline in their quality of life over time. It also demonstrated significant benefits on cardiac biomarkers and cardiac um, uh, echocardiographic features and had an acceptable safety profile. So we're hopeful that this will be reviewed favorably by the Food and Drug Administration and may be approved for use uh, later this year for patients. Another new therapy that literally was just announced and the data has not yet been published or presented, so it's um, all hot off the press, is another stabilizer. Um, you recall I mentioned one that was approved since 2019 called Tefamidus. This is called Acaromidus, um, and this is a similar stabilizer, and it was recently shown to be effective in a trial called Attribute CM that enrolled over 600 patients. And now we're seeing really fantastic 30-month or two-and-a-half-year survivals um, in these patients taking these drugs where over this time period, a few years ago, a decade ago, unfortunately, half the patients weren't alive in only two and a half or three years, some market improvements. And this drug was associated, compared with placebo, of a 25% risk reduction. 
There was also reported so far a 50% reduction in the risk for frequency of cardiovascular hospitalization. So patients are living longer and spending less time in the hospital. And the preliminary reports from the company and sponsors suggest that the drug was well tolerated with no safety signals. We're very looking forward to see the presentation of these data later at the European uh, Society of Cardiology meeting in late August and to more thoroughly scrutinize these data through publications. But uh, really um, a rather amazing data to know that we may soon have two uh, approved, we hope, uh, stabilizers on the market. So I'll conclude by just summarizing that more patients with a transthyroid and cardiac amyloidosis are being diagnosed, and they're being diagnosed at an earlier stage of disease because of greater awareness and efforts uh, like a McKenzie's mission, and the greater use of non-invasive imaging. Certainly identifying patients at an earlier stage of disease is very essential because disease-modifying therapy that specifically targets the misfolded proteins, either stabilizing them or shutting them off and silencing them, has been shown to be most effective when administered before patients develop severe cardiac dysfunction. Uh, very important to try to identify patients and institute therapy as early as possible. And um, these new therapies have really been demonstrated to be effective. So I think, as I highlighted at the beginning, the future is really bright for patients. And this is a wonderful area. Um, those of you who have the privilege of caring for patients with this particular disease, um, they are quite lovely. Um, their families are fantastic. Um, and uh, um, we're really happy to see that um, with their efforts um, in participating in these clinical trials, we've been able to successfully improve outcomes for our patients with this previous devastating disease. Again, thanks for your time and attention. As Dr. Maurer summarizes, the future is truly bright for patients with transthyretin cardiac amyloidosis. Between multiple therapies available and a robust pipeline of drugs and clinical trials, providers will have choices to better align patients with an appropriate therapy. For perspective, over 95% of the more than 7,000 rare diseases have no FDA-approved treatment, and amyloidosis now has a handful. This is amazing, and it gives patients more life-changing hope than ever before. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you'd like to watch Dr. Maurer's video, please visit McKenzie's Mission Education Hub at mm713.org. Thank you for listening to the All Things Amyloid podcast. If you find our podcast informative, please follow and share it with others. If you want to learn more about the work we're doing at McKenzie's Mission, please visit mm713.org. We'd also like to thank AstraZeneca Pharmaceuticals, Alexion Pharmaceuticals, Alnylam Pharmaceuticals, and Bridge Biopharma for their sponsorship to help raise awareness about amyloidosis. We hope you stay tuned for future episode drops. Thanks for listening.